three, two, one. We are live. Come out. What's happening, brother? What up? What up? What up? Let's do this. Yeah, man. We back for another round of Last Dance Life Lessons. So um, last time we covered episodes one and two, we'll cover episodes three and four today. And then next week, we'll do a couple so we can get, get caught up real fast. But uh, episode three, man, you know, talked a lot about Dennis Rodman. It, it opened up with the fact that uh, Scottie Pippen, because of his surgery, he was still sitting out. The Bulls are, are trying to, you know, have this quest for the three-peat without Scottie. And um, Dennis Rodman has to kind of step up as Jordan's number two. And that just yeah. leads to a lot of interesting moments, you know, between Michael and Rodman. And, um, you know, we can kind of talk about some of those details. We can kind of talk about the bad boys and the histories behind it. But um, but I wanted you to lead us off, man, and tell us anything about Rodman's career with Chicago. Uh, anything jumped out at you, man, that you found particularly interesting? I, I mean, I've actually spent a, a lot of time over the last couple of days, like, digging into what is this character of Dennis Rodman? Like, I think being an NBA fan and more of, like, the modern NBA um you know, I grew up kind of watching like Ron Artest and then, um, you know, the dude now is Draymond Green and like there's other players in that same kind of caliber. But Dennis Rodman's a whole nother beast, man. Yeah, um, he please. really paved, paved the way for um, just this different kind of energy, right? Like one of the things that um, I found really interesting when he came to the Bulls, him and Phil hit it off regarding like this love for Native American culture and artifacts and things of the like. And um, <clears throat> Phil called him. He was like, you know, Dennis, um, in the tribe where your necklace is from, um, you, you're what they would call a Hayoka. Um, and a Hayoka means uh, a backwards walking person. And, and, and that's just Dennis Rodman to the T, just like doesn't matter how the world is going, what everybody else is doing. Dennis Rodman is walking back and backwards and he's wearing sunglasses while doing it. Yeah, man. Well, it's interesting because like you said, not only is he unlike anybody that you see in the NBA today, but he's unlike even who most people knew him to be throughout most of his career. So, so one of the things that, that episode three kind of delves into a little bit is, is this background rivalry between the Bulls and Detroit, you know, um, Every NBA team's got that hump that they got to get over. They got that rivalry. They got that team that they need to get past if they want to ever get that title. And for the Bulls, those were the Pistons. And the Pistons were known as the bad boys because they had a really physical, aggressive style of play. And for all the chatter that we hear about how the players today didn't face any competition and they wouldn't be able to survive in the most competitive modern NBA People don't realize that this hand checking stuff that's illegal now, that was like baseline for defense back then in Jordan's day. That was baseline. If you drove to the basket, you're getting fouled really hard in a way that's going to make you think twice. Is it really important to me that I drive to the hole? Is, can I have it easier by hitting the jump shot? Shooting the jump shot was easier than going for the layup because of what you had to go through, the price you had to pay with your body. And nobody exemplified that better than the Pistons. And every year, man, the Bulls would run up against them and Detroit would just clobber them in different ways. You know, um, they would really push Michael. They would go all in and have an attitude of, we're going to force somebody else to beat us. You're not about to come in here and just be dropping 70 points at will. We're going to give it to you tough and we're going to force these other guys to step up. And they even had something called the Jordan rules, which was this defensive scheme. Some of them won't even admit to this day that there is such a thing. But there's this defensive scheme designed to just like really give it to Michael and give it to any other guys that are starting to step up. And um, and it, it proved pretty effective. And for a lot of years, the Bulls were just kind of whining about it, upset about it. And so when Rodman eventually comes to Chicago, there's a lot of history behind that. He's kind of like oh, the yeah. poster boy, you know, yeah. for everything that Chicago hated from those rivalry years. And so they they had to overcome their own suspicions, their own like concerns, their own resentment in order to even let him into their culture. I remember one commentator saying that this is either the shrewdest move that the Bulls have ever made or the dumbest move by bringing him in. But like, okay, when, when he left Detroit, 
he kind of was dealing with some different challenges and so forth. But then he went to San Antonio after that, before coming to Chicago. And that was like a very conservative kind of culture where his antics of getting technical fouls, behaving weirdly, just kind of got him a lot of texts. It didn't really fit in. And they were just fed up with him. Like, we're going to let this guy go. And the Bulls were like, we'll take a chance. And they brought him over there. And Robin was kind of like, hey, I, I think I feel free now. Start hanging out with Madonna. She started telling him, hey, man, do you be who you want to be? He started coloring his hair more, getting comfortable with himself. And if you look at the old footage of his Pistons days, he was a tough guy, but he was much more just like regular dude. But then when he got to Chicago, it was like, I'm going all out, man. I'm just going to be true to myself. And he embodied that for better and for worse, you know? Yeah, I think it I think it honestly started before he got to Chicago. I think on the back end of the Pistons era, um, Dennis Rodman was walling. Like he just embraced <laughs> this thing of the bad boys. Like he was, I think, like again, I spent some time like this week, like digging into to why does this cat tick the way he does? And he had a super rough upbringing. Like he grew up in the projects um of Dallas and was I think eventually kicked out the house by his mom at like 18 or 19 just on the street and he, he held that down for two years and he just thought that that's what life was going to be he wasn't hooping he wasn't like going to school he didn't care about any of that stuff um and I think like somebody who really comes off the street like that they just have a different set of priorities it's not what society sets for them it's survival. And I think, um, you know, as he transitioned to uh, the Pistons, he really found himself in just a really positive situation where there was a lot of people around him who wanted to see him succeed. There was, mm -hmm. when he was first kind of coming into the league, I uh, some of the players on the Pistons were saying that he was like immaturely um, or that he was painfully immature, meaning that like he had no life experience. He was not prepared for what the NBA brought. I know like in the first couple episodes of The Last Dance, we heard Michael talking about, um, you know, being in a hotel room with all these other players, drinking, smoking, um, doing coke and all these other drugs. And I think, you know, Dennis Rodman, even though he grew up on the street and had a hard life, like wasn't exposed to this party, you know, extra extravaganza life. And I think when he well, got he, he to- start playing ball until 21, right? Yeah, he, he his sisters played ball and stuff, but he didn't start hooping till till college. And yeah. so once he got to the Pistons, like they had a family, and 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 they and they they you know they kind of all came together over this common uh, villainization of the team that like we are the villains of the NBA, and and Rodman was just like I think Lambeer, their center, and Rodman just just stepped into that like like we're gonna f you up if you try to come through this paint. And I think they really embraced that. And once that started to fall apart, once that dynasty kind of started to die off, I think a lot of things in Robin's personal life also were taking a hit at the same time. Um, and it, it was just this nasty culmination where, you know, somebody from who started from the bottom kind of went up, won two championships with Detroit, and then really started ticking right back down. And that downturn was you know, that's when the drag dressing like a drag queen, that's when, um, you know, dying his hair, like all that stuff started happening in this city that loved Robin, like loved what he did for the organization. And I think that's something to bring up, like, you know, people love you when you're great, but when you're not like, who's really with you. And the city loved him as like their child. And then when he wasn't like, didn't this was a problem in child. They were like, get him out of here, man. Like he, he's destructive. We don't want this diva. Then he went to the Spurs and then on to the Bulls. And by the time he got to the Bulls, I mean, he had just been through it, right? Like he was already found in the parking lot with like a gun, you know, like right up to his neck. Like he was, you know, it, it's hard to say now, but, he, like he was in a position to kill himself um and 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 i think just like the mind the mind of dennis rodman is just so deep dark um and, and in a lot of ways fascinating that he was just one of the you know best outstanding players that we've, we've ever seen you know especially at that position um and so yeah i, I think he just brought such a uh 
a certain like freeness to the bulls that like, you know, you don't have to like me or love me. And I think that's actually what he said when he got to the Spurs, you don't have to like me or love me, but I'm going to get solid on this court. And so when he came to uh, the bulls, they just embraced that. They're like, all right, well, let's roll. If you talk in championships and that's all we needed to hear. Yeah, you know, it reminds me how in, in, in one of the first episodes, how they talked about how, how upset Jordan was when Charles Oakley left. They traded Oakley because Oakley was like yeah. his executioner. Oakley, Oakley was his bully protector. He did, he did the dirty work. Somebody gave Jordan a dirty foul, like got in Jordan's face. Oakley was the dude that was like, hey, I'll get kicked out of a game and get in somebody's face. And the Bulls didn't have anybody like that since Oakley. You know, they had guys that were intense and competitive, but Rodman, but Rodman brought that kind of energy, that, that sort of energy that said, I'll get kicked out of a game. I don't care if anybody doesn't like me. I'm going to do, do the dirty work it takes, you know, to be able to get that victory. So let me, but let me ask you about that. Like, you know, in the broader sense, like I know on the this first time we had the conversation, we were talking about like how, how does any of this relate to like real life or like your career or working in business or whatever, you know, being on any kind of team ever, like, is there always going to be a place on teams for people like that? You know, that hot wire, hot, high energy, just intensive dude um, or person or gal, um, like somebody who's just like, again, is a hot wire. Do you think there's always a place for somebody on a team like that? Or is that just in sports that we see that? So I'm going to say yes and no. Let me give you the no part first. The no part is uh, much of what Rodman brought to the Chicago Bulls, it could be argued that, you know, the red hair, the green hair wasn't a necessary part of that. M maybe that's what he needed to feel like he was being himself. But the Bulls didn't win more championships because of the color of Rodman's hair, because of the nose ring, right? So we got to make a distinction between the, the external aspects of flair and the essence of flair in terms of what you actually do. And... The dirty work part, here's where I'll give my yes. I'll say in every organization, I'll say in every job, without exception, there are always going to be important tasks that have to be done that nobody wants to do because it's either scary or it's uncomfortable or you got to deal with the, the angry customer. There's always some stuff like that where when it comes time to do that, everybody wants to run in the opposite direction because just because the business everybody might close up, Say what? I was just saying everybody wants to be Michael. Everybody wants to be the do the do the finesse, hit the game winner. Yeah, yeah, but but nobody wants to be that cat who is diving for the loose ball, right? Uh, or, or or nobody wants to be that guy that's down low defending Shaq and wearing himself out for forty minutes a game, going at it with Karl Malone, going at it with Shaquille O'Neal, being that guy, taking the toughest defender every night, you know hopping around trying to get that one rebound and man you just spent enough energy for the entire game on that one rebound then you throw the outlet pass and you sprint down the court to try to get the rebound in case somebody misses that's less glamorous too it's not just hard work to do but fans don't tend to calculate that stuff as much when they're figuring out who's the greatest you know it, it, it's it's the stuff that's obvious and so i would say every organization needs a Rodman or needs you to be able to activate that Rodman side of yourself in order to be able to do some of the things that are tough, man. What about you? What do you think? Yeah, I think I, for whatever reason, like I just like if if I was, um, you know, on the leadership team of an organization, I need my sales guys to be my Rodmans. I, you know, uh, even on a sales team, I think that's super yeah. valuable to just have that dude who, yeah. who just who just has that chip on his shoulder, who just doesn't yeah. care what, you know, anybody is going to tell him because what's, what's, I think what's imperative to be successful in sales is that like hearing a no can't take you down. It, it can't demoralize you. It can't deflate you. You got to keep moving. And I think Rodman did that better than anybody. I mean, he's wearing a you know, a wedding dress at his book signing with lipstick all over his face doesn't give, you know, just give zero, I'm not going to say the other word, but just give zero 
when it comes to what people thought, what people were telling him to do, yeah. it didn't matter. He's just going to do Rodman. I think, like, yeah, you need that. It, a lot yeah, of people what, don't what, think it, it's hard to step into that. Like, yeah. I think, you know, coming from the streets, like, where – it doesn't matter what people think of you. It just matters like what you think of yourself. A lot of people don't feel that. I know I don't like, I, th I know it matters um, what people think. And I think, you know, be that being able to just operate like that is a, is a, it's just a place of freedom, inner freedom. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things we talked about, you know, last time is just, is, is like Kobe and, and, and MJ and how they had to go through that journey of feeling what it's like to be loved and then have that taken away from you, right? Whereas Rodman had a background where maybe he got a heavier dosage of that than Michael and Kobe early on. And I think when it comes to just being over what people think and not caring so much, I, I, I think you have to experience it. I, I think you have to experience what it's like to be disliked and misunderstood or hated, rightly understood and hated. You have to experience that in order to know how capable you how capable you are of living without it. It's kind of like failure. You know, before you get your first taste of failure, you build it up in your mind as this like insurmountable thing, as this monster that will freaking kill you and never give you a second try. And then when you actually take a risk and you fail, you realize that failure from the inside out is a lot less intimidating than failure from the outside looking in. And then you say, all right, I'm not afraid to fail. And then you get a little bit more bolder and you start to take more and more risk, but you got to experience it. And I, I think that's true for anybody. And Rodman just got a lot of that, you know, up front. you know what I mean? Um, wh one thing I would say too about, about the sales thing, for me, one of the <laughs> ways this played out in my career is uh, early on, I got, a, I got a glimpse from working in restaurants of how valuable you can become if you can maintain composure when you're dealing with an angry customer, even more so if you can get that customer to smile by the end of the interaction. And so being self-interested, wanting to create career advantages for myself, I made up my mind at a very early age that if there's an angry customer somewhere and I'm an employee in that organization, I am going to beg to be the one to talk to that person, to be the one to solve it. And the first few times I might fail, I may have some experiences where I felt like that customer really gave me the business. But given the way that most people are scared of that, if you can be the person that says, I want that, I want that, I want to die for that loose ball, then you can become an indispensable member of your organization by just taking that opportunity. So that's one example of like how you can be a Rodman, like pay close attention to those things. It can be as simple as taking out the garbage. It can be something like cleaning up the bathrooms, dealing with the angry customer, making the cold calls. What are those things that everybody else is running away from doing? And if you can get comfortable doing those and do them with a smile on your face, you'll be the person that is one of the most difficult ones to get rid of when times are hard. And like with Rodman, sometimes you'll find that people are more willing to accommodate your need for freedom if you can be really, really valuable in the direction of doing things that other people maybe are too afraid to do, you know? Yeah, I think... I think not only was he not afraid to do it, like he he didn't care about doing anything else, which is what made him so unique. Like it's it, it, it's one thing, right, to take on that angry customer one time out the week or maybe a couple times out the week. Rodman wanted it every single call. Every single angry customer put me on the phone with him. I want to be in their face. I want to be the one to take on that challenge and didn't care about anything else. Didn't care if he clocked in on time. Didn't care if he clocked out at time. Robin didn't care about scoring. He didn't care about passing. He cared about getting rebounds. He could, I think that he, there was like four games where he had like four points or less, but like 20, 20 points, 20 points. Like in the NBA today, that's really, people aren't going to chase that. They're not going to like find this one thing that everybody else hates and they just love that. They want to be well-rounded players. They want the, the entire package Rodman was a specialist as, you know, as special as they come. Um, and, and it's just crazy how he built an entire career about being good at his role and doing it and like, and just knowing his role and playing it better than anybody else.
I want to go to how that third episode ended, which was pretty interesting. Um, it's the middle of the season. Rodman kind of feels special now because he's moved up into MJ's number two. Him and Jordan are talking a lot. And then Scotty comes back. And Scotty comes back and it's sort of like, yay, you know, I got my number two back. And and Robin sort of steps down a little bit. And he was kind of dealing with that. He felt a little bad about it. And and Robin always struggled with things like boredom. How does he keep himself motivated? He always just had a, a, a need for a certain amount of flair in his life. So he goes up to Phil Jackson and he's like, I need a vacation. And Phil Jackson says this to Michael. And Michael is like, what? A vacation? I need a vacation more than anybody on this team. It's the middle of the season. There's no vacation. And and Phil says, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about giving him, you know, just a little bit of time. Maybe I give him 48 hours. And Jordan was like, if you give him that, you're not going to see him again. And Jordan adamantly protested it. And Phil was like, I'm going to give him some time. You know, you know, like, I'm, I'm going to give him that trust. And he calls up Dennis and he's like, can you take your vacation in 48 hours? Then it says, I I'll take whatever you can give me. And Phil was like, 48 hours, get whatever you got to get out of your system. Robin was immediately like, I, like, I don't know if that meeting, I don't remember if it was live or a phone call, but whatever the case, as soon as it was over, the brother was on the plane off to Vegas, partying it up. And, and, and the episode kind of ends with him going off to take that party. And I, I want to get your thoughts on that. But like one of the things that, that I think goes along with what you said about how special Rodman was. I think when you look at the relationship between him and Phil Jackson, it, th there's a lot to be said there too about how special Phil was because as special as Rodman was, as talented as he was, that stuff didn't fly in San Antonio. And Phil figured out a way to work with Rodman's greatness in a way that allowed the team to benefit from it. You can't separate Rodman's contribution to Chicago with the way Phil handled him because San Antonio wasn't able to get that out of him because they were too busy just being angry all the time and how weird he was. Yeah, I think I think Phil's great in a lot of ways, right? I think there there's a lot more that I want to say to to his legacy and 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 how he kind of came to be. But in terms of Rodman, I think when I heard a little bit about how Phil Jackson as a player used to act, how he used to play basketball. Um, he kind of came from this household where, you know, he it was very insular. He was raised um, by a mother who was very religious, who, who made them put, um, you know, their religious studies and, and their schoolwork, everything first. And he, all he wanted to do was play basketball. And so when he got on the court, he would smack players around. He was rough. He was energetic. And I think like he got a chance to let out all that, um, pent up energy out on the basketball court against his opponents. You know, when he was a player, he isn't he wasn't the same Zen Buddhist um, philosopher that we know of Phil Jackson. Now he was the aggressor. He was physical. And so I think having that experience as a player and and just how different he were, was as a person anyway, like Phil Jackson, I'm sure like it doesn't it's not too far distant, but you can look at him and tell he's kind of a hippie. And I think when he was younger he really embraced that. He was cool being different. He was cool not, you know, tuning into the all-star life of NBA culture. And I think that's why the relationship between Phil and Dennis just mended so well. Like it, it, it came together effortlessly. Um, I think them accepting Dennis on their team, them accepting this crazy hot wire diva on their team was in large part Scotty and Michael but Phil was the one who had, you know, to, to tame the stallion. And I think, you know, from kind of coming from that, that different approach to life in general, like from his own personal experiences, I think it just put him in a good position, um, you know, to meet Dennis with that same kind of energy. Absolutely, man. I mean, what other coach in the NBA has given the brother a mid-season vacation? <laughs> what, what, what other coach is even having that conversation? Right. What other coach is not reminding you at that moment of what your contract is and what you better do, where you better be at what time, you know, because of what the rules are and, and feel understood something deeper that allowed him to kind of 
find that balance with Rodman. You know, it, it reminds me of just an important principle about about the power of context. You know, everybody in your life that is irritating to you is a possible genius in somebody else's system based on how somebody else deals with them. And everybody out there that's irritating to somebody else could be a genius in your system or it could be really valuable to you if you know how to relate to them, if you know how to use their gifts and talents. And well, I, I know one of the implications this has for me in my career is I never ever allow other people's experience to be the final determiner of how I'm supposed to experience somebody else. I remember one time when I was working at this restaurant, there, there was this uh, customer that came in and um, one of the one of the uh, the hosts came up to me and said, TK, I'm apologize to you ahead of time. This customer is a da, 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 da. and they said, you know, every time they come in here, every time they come in here, they want to give the food back. They want to complain. They want to refund all of this kind of stuff. And I could have allowed that to get me hyped up. After all, I'm hearing on the good authority that this customer is like that. And, and from what I'm being told, other servers have experienced this, experienced it this way. And I went into it with the attitude of like, you know what? Okay, I appreciate it. You know, I, I, I respect you looking out for me. Thank you very much. And then as I walked away in my mind, my thought was, okay, I'm gonna create my own experience here. I'm, I'm gonna look at this through the lens of who I am and how I deal with people because I'm gonna give myself the chance to bring something out of a person that maybe nobody else before me has done. Why not? Why not give myself that chance? Yeah, I can keep that in mind, but I'm going to give myself a chance to bring something new out of this person. And, and, and would you know it, this person, when they got their food, they absolutely complained about it. They got so mad. They sent it back. But even then, because I wasn't all hyped up, I was like, absolutely. My apologies. I'll go ahead and get it taken care of. Nothing was wrong with this person's food. But I saw that this person needed some attention. They needed some love. And I gave it to him. I gave it to him in spades. And when I brought the food back to make sure I checked on him, I talked with them for a little bit. And after a while, that person looked at me and said, what do you do? And we started to have a conversation. And that person became a regular of mine. That person became a nice customer of mine. They asked to sit in my section. They would tip me really well. They never sent their food back, never complained about anything again. They just needed that one person that knew how to connect with them. And that changes for all of us, but it speaks to what Phil Jackson did. It speaks to the power of Absolutely. Sam. I'm not going to limit my possibilities to how the Spurs management experienced him. I'm going to give myself a chance to maybe experience him differently. And you, and you got to do that in life. Absolutely. I think, um, I mean, that's a gr just great illustration. You know, on, on a kind of a different note with, you know, Michael Jordan, he wasn't excited about Phil Jackson coming in to be the coach. Um, because previously, before Phil got there, he was coached by a guy named Doug Collins. And Doug Collins was a younger coach, had a lot of energy, um, and kind of met Michael with that competitive fire right like let's go you know like shove it down their throats like let's kill them and i think he was sweating more after the games than, than the players were <laughs> i think what i liked about one of the things doug collins said that i had to write down because it was just so good he was just like the greatest respect you can give a player is to coach him hard and i think him mm. and michael just had this unspoken agreement where i like we're, I know that I'm dealing with somebody who is trying to win. And like, despite us being friends, despite me liking you as a person, like I'm going to coach the hell out of you. I'm, and I'm going to make you work. I'm going to stack the practice where it's four versus one and boo hoo you, you know, you like, if you lose, so what? And I think Michael really fed off of that. And so that's really different than Phil Jackson and his Zen, um, you know, Native American, um, just like cool, calm and collective approach, right? And so I guess, you know, if you're looking for a mentor or if you're even dealing with um, a person in leadership, you know, who's above you, how would you kind of recommend, uh, you know, how would you kind of recommend na navigating those, those, those very different approaches, right? Like, I guess, as the mentor, like, how would you kind of recommend 
um, navigating it? And as the mentee, you know, how would you navigate, uh, how would you recommend navigating just those stark, starkly different approaches? Yeah, you know, when you're in a position of leadership, you don't always have full control over the kinds of personalities you need to deal with, right? And so there's kind of a greater burden on you to up your game and not just limit yourself to one particular tool. You got to have a lot of different management tools in your toolbox and you got to be prepared to deal with a lot of different personality types. Some people just will never learn how to manage their time. And the things you have to do to compensate for that, to help them create structure, to help them be accountable to what they need to do are different from the people that don't need a lot of, you know, micromanaging, the people that don't need a lot of structure created for them. And you have just, some people need a lot of bells and whistles. They need a lot of company. They need a lot of attention. There are some people who prefer to be left alone and just trust it to deliver the result. There are just so many different types of personalities that you'll have. I think as a leader, you have to be constantly studying, constantly evolving, constantly observing, you know, other different styles besides your own, because you're not just, you don't have the luxury of being an employee who just comes in and does your job. You have to think for many different people across the organization and sometimes across departments. And and so one of the things I think is important if you want to be a great leader is you absolutely must have some kind of practice set up where you are interacting with other leaders that are not part of your organization because they're going to be the best people to take you outside of your own natural, you know, habitual thought patterns and, and get you to see management in an entirely different way. Sometimes it can be hard to get the feedback that you need from the people who work under you because even if you encourage it, even if you say, hey, guys, give me feedback, criticize me, there's always going to be that sense of hierarchy in other people's minds. There's always going to be that sense of like, yeah, but would I be crossing the line? What if my boss doesn't agree with me? Will that get me in trouble? Will it cost me social capital? And so you need people that have the courage to speak into your life, to challenge your opinions, to give you another perspective who just aren't afraid of you. And nobody's going to do that like other leaders that have no vested interest in your customers and your organization. If you are looking for mentors, you live at one of the luckiest times ever because now the chances are that if there's some personality you don't like running, you know, learning from, you got hundreds of other people's you can people you can choose from who might teach a subject or deliver knowledge in a way that works for you. And so I would say if you're in a position where you're just looking for people that you can learn from, then you know, just try to pick someone who seems like they're doing the kinds of things that you want to do and try to pick someone that seems to be communicating things in a way that you can receive and don't be afraid to let other people challenge you. You know, uh, one thing I always, I often tell people to keep in mind is that sometimes people's willingness to criticize you is a signal that they're still willing to invest in you because the moment they give up on you, they're not going to give you feedback. They're just going to be done with you, you know? So, so try to be the kind of person to not only look for what you need, but don't take the, don't take constructive feedback too personally look at it as an opportunity to get better you know for sure and i think that's what doug collins like wasn't afraid to to give you the cold hard facts yeah. whereas bill jackson was was you know he would give those cold hard facts when when it was just very necessary but outside of that he had um just a a, a really dynamic approach right it i mean the study of phil jackson is the whole conversation in itself but I think one of the things that I wanted to bring up, um, one, and, and one of the things that I noticed that was just a stark difference between uh, Michael playing under both coaches is that when Michael was playing under Doug Collins, this coach that pretty much set up the entire offense so Michael could play his kind of ball, right? Um, Michael could take over a game, drop 40, drop 50, drop 60, and the crowd loves it, the city loves it, um, the fans love it. like. You know, nobody's complaining. I think during that time, Michael won all these individual accolades. He was MVP of the league. He was defensive player of the year. He was um, MVP of the all-star game. You know, all these individual accolades. And I think when Phil Jackson kind of came on the block, he was like, wait, you're trying to do what? You're trying to take the ball out of my hands. 
why would I let you do that? Like I'm carrying this team to heights that it's never seen before. And I think what Phil Jackson, you know, why I admire him is he had the confidence and the foresight to know that that can only get us so far. And I, one of the yeah. things in, I think that was episode four that stood out to me is like, it was at the very end when, when they were in one of their series and he was like, Michael, who's open? John Paxson, pass him the ball. He needs to get the ball. Um, and Michael listened. And I think once Phil really took over, um, he implemented this triangle offense that required the players to trust one another, that required them to play team basketball. And I think, you know, it got Michael to a place where he was willing to forego the individual accolades for those championship rings. And I think, you know, the leader sets the tone for that. And, and just to kind of be on board, like, look, y'all, I'm not chasing these MVPs anymore. I'm trying to win these championships. And if that means I got to trust Paxson, if that means I got to trust Kerr, if that means I got to trust, you know, Rodman or Bill Cartwright, whomever, like I'm going to trust them and I'm going to trust my coach. And, uh, you know, it, it's just amazing that Phil was able to do that. Another thing that I was really excited to learn about Phil is that Phil's kind of been a winner this entire time. Phil won in in, in the NBA, he won two championships just as a player on the Knicks. I think from that, he went on to coach some international team, super intense environment. Um, and then I think from there, he went on to coach the CBA. And, you know, you can give the audience a little bit more background than I can on the CBA and the difference between the two. But um, he, he won the ring at the CBA level. And then he went on to win six rings with the Bulls. And then he went on to win five rings with the Lakers. Like there's something about just knowing how to win that is just so powerful, right? That that it that it it almost transcends whatever league or whatever level you're playing at. It's just winning is winning. And it, if you know what it takes to get to the championship, you hear that all the time. You know, the LeBrons of the league talk about it. The, the D Wades, the Kyries, they talk about how what it takes to really play at that championship level and to get there season after season. Um, and I think, you know, once you once you know how to win, it transfers and you can take that with you. Um, and I think that's why Phil Jackson was just able to elevate that team to another level because the dude knew how to win. Yeah, man, I think it, I think it connects very well with your earlier point about the kind of guy that Phil was and why he was able to be so empathetic towards Rodman. He had a sense of who he wanted to be in this world and he wasn't going to break just because somebody else got mad about that or somebody else didn't agree with that. And you saw that play a huge role in cultivating that winning mindset in Chicago, because you got to think about, think about how like gutsy of a move this is. You come onto a Bulls team, where it has already been established before you got here, man, that Michael Jordan is the premier athlete, not just in Chicago, but the NBA, okay? And you're going to tell this guy, you're going to call this guy out on who's open? And, and Phil, Phil actually said one time, stop trying to be Superman and pass the ball, yeah. okay? Yeah. So you're the new guy in an organization, and you're going to call out your superstar, a guy who probably has the weight to be able to walk into the manager of the GM and say, get rid of this guy, I'm not playing, right? And we have seen that happen in the NBA. This is not a mere yeah. hypothetical. We have seen very good proven coaches lose their jobs because they dare to call out a superstar with a big ego. And Phil calls Michael Jordan out, stop trying to be Superman and pass the ball. And what does Jordan do? He responds to it. And, and so a big part of the winning mindset is saying, look, I not only know what it takes to win, but I'm not going to compromise that by being cute and charming at the expense of truth. I'm not going to say, hey, Michael, it may be, I mean, you know, either way is fine with me. You know, it doesn't really matter because uh, everything's equal, uh, but, it, but it might be somewhat mildly helpful if you just kind of looked around and uh, maybe somebody who knows could be open. No, Michael, who's open? I have an opinion here. I have an opinion, and I and I think you're missing a truth. Somebody's open. Who's open, Michael? Paxson. 
okay, dude, pass the ball to him. I'm talking to you like I have an idea that's better than yours. Go try what I'm asking you to do, right? Like that mm -hmm. takes guts, man. And in order to win, you got to be able to give the best ideas a chance to succeed. And you can't be afraid to be honest about where you are to give feedback about what's going on. So in some ways, just like Doug Collins, he was willing to coach Michael hard, but not by yelling, but by speaking truth to him, you know, asking him the right questions. That's critical, man. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Hey, so speaking of winning mindset, like <laughs> episode four, episode four opened up with, uh, with Jordan going to Vegas to get Rodman. Um, because <laughs> I, I love how they showed it on the screen. It was so funny. It said, uh, you know, you know, like like 48 hours, th th that he has 48 hours and the number just keeps going up and he hasn't reported in. It, it shows the word with permission, 48 hours. The hours keep going up and the word with turns to without. <laughs> and it just keeps going up. Rodman's like ghost. Jordan was completely right. And so it looked like maybe Phil was wrong. Phil trusted Rodman. Rodman violated that trust by ghosting the Bulls. Um, and, and here we see Michael's way of being like, don't give a guy too long of a leash, kind of begin to play a role. And Jordan goes to Vegas and basically knocks on that door and is like, dude, we got a championship to win, man. Let's go. Let's go. And Rodman comes with him. But I wanted to get your thoughts on that, man. I, I mean... I, I kind of would feel the same way as Michael, like, yeah, especially if you if you're in pursuit of a sixth ring, you know how much is on the line for this doggone season, bro. Like, what the heck are you doing taking a vacation, bro? Like, what am I doing having to pull you out of bed with God knows what's in it? Um, and it's like, dog, like, I, I you know, you, you kind of just got to laugh a little. Like, you're just like, you know what? Let, let's go. Get, get your stuff. Let's go. Like, you know, and I think w once they got to practice, Phil was just like, Dennis, have you been taking care of your body? Have you been running? And and then uh, Michael was like, Phil, his body's here. Dennis going to be all right. We're going to be all right. Like, he made it. So I think, like, it just talk, it just speaks to the trust, like, yeah, they let Dennis go off and do his own thing. But, like, when he came back, he was outrunning all of them in practice. Dennis is just a monster. Bro. Like, he doesn't – he defies what's possible because he'll go out and he'll drink till four, and then he'll drop – like, he'll drop, like, 15 points, 40 rebounds that next night. So, I, it, there's no explaining. There's no logic to, 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 um, to Dennis Rodman's madness – I think one of his earlier coaches um, was told, like, to kind of stop talking to him, like, leave him alone. You can't put a saddle on a stallion. And that's exactly what Dennis Rodman is. Yeah, man. And, and like, from a, from a management philosophy standpoint, it's a, it's a good reminder that there's no cookie-cutter approach you can use to, mm. to build a championship team. You, you got to understand that everybody can't be coached and managed and led in the same way. And, and you got to evaluate people by the results and you got to give them what they need in order to be able to give you what you need. Um, one of the things I love about Michael Jordan going down there to Vegas is that he could have just been mad and just been like, fire this guy, cut this guy, right? But he understood that sometimes you got to fight for your people. Sometimes you got to fight for them. Sometimes it's, it's not the appropriate response to sit around and gossip and talk trash behind this guy's back for an, a week. Sometimes it's not the time to be self-righteous or it's not the time to be like vindictive and angry and be like, we'll teach this guy a lesson that he doesn't do this on the Chicago Bulls, fire him. <laughs> no, it, it's kind of like an act of humility to yeah. get on a plane and go to Vegas and be like, you are a complete screw up and a complete knucklehead, but dude, I need you. I need you, right? <laughs> like, let's go. <laughs> And, and, and I think that's something that kind of get overlooked, gets overlooked about Michael's competitiveness or his arrogance or whatever. He did have a strong sense of like when he needed somebody and he was willing to fight for his teammates, you know? Yeah. 
I, I, I thought, I think like winning just meant more than anything else to them. Yeah. You know, if, if you're here to win and I think there's something to be said about that, right? Like, you know, if, if, if you're in life and you're in it to win it, like it doesn't, as long as the people around you are in it to win it too, then, then that's kind of, that's what takes precedent. Like everybody kind of has their own approach to winning. And I think if you spend so much time trying to file them in, and try to or to your definition of winning you're losing the the big picture right it's about these championships um and it's just it's about winning and i think michael knew that scotty had to get over that um and then dennis rodman just is going to be dennis rodman but in the end like they prevailed yeah we got to talk about carmen electra man she makes a cameo in this documentary oh, oh we, we got to talk about carmen electra we can't pretend yeah. like she wasn't in it. Uh, yes, so so it was interesting hearing her perspective on this. I mean, she shows up for like maybe a minute or two. And um, basically, Rodman disappears. He's in Vegas partying. His girlfriend is Carmen Electra. And the way she describes it, she says he's like one of the best people in the world to party with, right? He's like so fun and she's having a great time with him, right? And Rodman, you know, goes beyond his deadline. And Jordan is like, I got to go get this guy, gets on a plane, goes to Vegas, knocks on the door. And from Carmen Electra's description, from her point of view, she's like, oh, my gosh, she freaks out. And she, you know, she she covers herself up because she doesn't want Jordan seeing her like this. And, and Jordan just like gives the business to Rob and like, dude, we got to go. <laughs> and... <laughs> And uh, if she didn't tell it, we wouldn't know because Jordan didn't even put his business out there, right? He was like, I'm not going to say who, who he was in the bed with. He, he, didn't, he didn't give up that information. She did. But here's what was interesting to me. And, and, and I think there's so there's such an important life insight that's captured in something that Carmen Electra said. She said, I didn't even know. I didn't even know the dude was missing games. I didn't even know. Okay, so first of all, first of all, before I even say what the lesson is to me, that that's just an amazing thought in and of itself because I can't imagine ever being in that position of not knowing. And here's what I mean. I'm hanging out with somebody who is a basketball player <laughs> by profession, right? At some point, a, a, a phone call or a text have to be sent, like, let's go to Vegas and party. There's no way I'm about to be hanging out with somebody for two days or a week at a time where I normally don't get to see them. They're a basketball player by profession, even if I don't care about the sport, like how things go with the team. Oh, you, you got a vacation? Like you got some days off? Like nothing, right? <laughs> nothing. And that's okay because it's not Carmen Electra's responsibility to make sure Dennis Rodman does what he needs to do in order to be who he wants to become in life. But I, I, you know, I always say something. I always say that some people are great for grabbing a beer with and other people are great for going to battle with. Carmen Electra in this story represents the person that's great for going to beer with. A lot of fun, always ready to have a good time. And if you go hang out with them, wow, will it be a blast? And, you know, you can paint the town blue. Michael Jordan represents the person that's good for going to battle with. They want to compete, they want to win, and they're going to push you to be accountable to what you need to do to create results. And I think this distinction is so important because I think we all have our Carmen Electras. We all have people that love to hang out with us, that love to have fun with us. And these people are never going to stop and say, yo, come out, TK, don't you have some stuff you need to be studying? Don't you have some stuff you need to be building? If you don't bring it up, and if you're not the one to say, yo, I got to end the hangout time so that I can go handle my business, that moment is never going to come. They will hang out with you all day, all night, every day, every night, and they're never going to get to the point to be like, yo, come out. I know you got more to do in life than hang out with me. I know you've got some goals and things you want to succeed at. Like, don't you have to go do that? Nope. That's something that you got to take responsibility for. And like one of the most important things about fulfilling your potential is you cannot rely on the people that love hanging out with you to be the ones that's going to hold you accountable for the work that you got to put in in order to create mm -hmm. uncommon results. And you can't even rely on having a, a Michael Jordan in your life that's going to come knocking on your door. But what Michael Jordan really represents for me in this story 
is the voice of consequence. Because whether you have a Michael Jordan in your life or not, there will come a day where somebody will come knocking on your door, demanding an account for how you spent your time. You know, mm-hmm. somebody's gonna come knocking on your door and say, yo, the gig is up. It, it, it's, it's now time to be accountable for what you have been doing to, and to either pay the consequences for that or experience the benefits of that. And the Carmen Electra that you're hanging out with is not going to remind you of that. They're not even going to ask you the questions about yourself to get the knowledge they need to have in order to push you to do the things that you need to do. You got to be careful around those Carmen Electras and they come in every form. It's not just the beautiful woman. It can be the homie that just want to watch sports with you all day, that just want to watch, you know, drink beers with you all day. It can be another dude. It ain't even got to be about the looks. It's it's about the mindset and the mentality. And to me, that's something that really jumped out at me. You know what I mean? For sure. I mean, I think my question is like, what kind of person is Dennis Rodman? Like, what is the of those two categories? Which type does he fall under? Yeah, you know, I mean, I have to I have to judge the man based on what he actually did. To me, Dennis Rodman is a winner, but he's also a complex human being. He had his temptations. He had his vices. He had his struggles. And fortunately, he had the support system set up in his life and the relationships in his life that allowed him to not go too far on the dark side, you know, so that he couldn't recover, so that he was still able to live a great life, accomplish some great things and and, and, and kind of, you know, do what he needed to do. But yeah, I do think there is a very realistic possible world in which Rodman just goes all the way to the dark side. And I, I'm pretty sure he's grateful for having the Chuck Daly's in his life, the Phil Jackson's in his life, you know, the Michaels and the Scotties, the John Sallies and the Lambeers who kind of kept yeah. him focused because we all need that. We, we all need to make sure that there's more to who we spend in time with than just that person that's always up for grabbing a beer. You got to make sure you got some people in your circle that want to go to battle with you and it's going to push you to hit the gym, hit the weights, do something constructive, whatever it may be. And Rodman did have yeah. that. And I, and I think he was smart enough to, to know that he needed to surround himself with those kind of people, you know? Yeah, I think I think um, what's clear about Dennis Rodman is that while that was present in the NBA, after being out of the NBA, you know, that support system evaporates. People are only going to are going to support you for so long. Right. And and a lot of people are only going to support you if you are pushing the same agenda or, you know, trying to achieve, achieve the same goals that they're trying to achieve. Right. Um, once it once you kind of fulfill that mission or once you get too off track from their mission, like that support could evaporate. And I think, you know, once Dennis Rodman you know, fell out of the NBA, his life just spun out of control. And I think having that support system in that structure was really good. But at some point, you got to pick up some of those habits. You got to you got to um, let these 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 good figures, these good behaviors, this good structure imprint upon your behavior. Um, you're almost using the structure as a crutch and to 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 not kind of grow and and to and to really learn from what what what's being taught where you're having success um i i think is just a missed opportunity and it's one that that just kind of played out ugly for him um because he didn't he didn't really learn it, it was like having um a parent just have to continue to continue continue and to continue and continue to tell you that the stove is hot um but you know they're only going to pull your hand away from it so many times. And Dennis Rodman was the kind of cat that's just like palm flat on there. Just like, let's see what happens this today. Yeah. You, you know, I, I haven't, I haven't kept too much up with him, you know, after his NBA career. But one, one thing I'll say is, is, is you know, th- there are two aspects to, to greatness or, or even to integrity, in my opinion. One of them is making sure that you can transform your strength, your weaknesses into strengths as much as you can, you know, or, or like maximize your strength, so to speak. But the other is, is being honest with yourself about your weaknesses, 
enough to set up boundaries in your life that can protect you from those weaknesses leading to destruction. So I'm of the opinion that there are certain things that we're all just gonna kind of be weak at all of our lives and that it's not always worth the investment to try to be great at all those different things. You know, and, and there are some people where it's just like, man, you know what? I think after 20 years, I'm comfortable saying you're just never gonna be that person that's just like meticulously organized, right? I'm, I'm not saying it's it's ever too late to turn over a new leaf, that it's ever too late to develop a new skill, but we all have our things that we're just not as good at, and it might be worth it to, to just double down on the things that we can be great at, but what's important is if you're not good at those things, you got to make sure that you structure your relationships and your lifestyle in a way to where you have the support that you need. And I think for Rodman, I, I don't think it's that he didn't change. I think it's that the NBA just made it easier for him to have that support network because the goal was clearly defined, win a championship. And you've got some of the greatest players and the greatest coaching staff in the history of basketball surrounding you. And so it's kind of built in. It, it, it reminds me of like, how going to college is for a lot of people. When you go to college, you kind of have to try hard not to meet new people because you're just immersed in an environment where there are just people all around. Just walk through your residence hall and whatever mm. open door you see, stop at the door and say, what's up? And you probably have yourself a new friend, right? But when you go out into the real world, it's not ready-made like that. You're living in a neighborhood where there's a lot more age variety, a lot more career variety, and it takes a lot of effort now to be able to put yourself in a situation to make friends. It's like that when you leave your job, it's why so many people get depressed when they retire. A lot of the structures that are set up for us at work, we kind of got to create them for ourselves. And maybe maybe he just never figured out a way to create that for himself outside of work where the NBA kind of provided it for him, you know? I got one last question for you. Yeah. How, um, how do you think like, in the context of the Revolution One, the project that both of us work on together, um, in in the context of this project, you know, what are some of the things that you see parallels between us and the Bulls, or may, maybe lessons that are paralleled between us, you know, and their um, and their journey to greatness? Yeah. So first, when when it comes to questions like that. The hardest question is, where do I not see the parallels? You know, where do I not see them? Because to me, whether we're talking about sports, movies, philosophy, it's always through the lens of how can we use our observations of and participation in human experience to make ourselves better? You know what I mean? Um, and sports provide some pretty cool metaphors for that. You can get those metaphors from other areas of life. But to me, it's all the same conversation. But like parallels in terms of this project, you know, one is we're trying to do something that uh, that's not a cakewalk. We're trying to do something that's really difficult. We're, we're trying to do something that's challenging. And there's a dimension to it that's never been done. So what what is that? Well, for starters, motivation, personal development, doesn't everybody and their mom do this? Have you not been on Instagram or Twitter and observed how many people out there are constantly flooding the world with inspirational quotes and inspirational videos? Does the world really need somebody else to do this? I think the strong argument would be, no, we don't. If we decided to stop doing this right now, would anybody miss us? I think the strong argument would be no, probably not, right? And I'm sure somebody's gonna give a comment because they think I'm being insecure right now. I'll be like, no, TK, I would miss you. Get out of here. I don't need to hear that right now, right? I'm keeping it real. But <laughs> as with anything in life that you believe in very deeply, that means a lot to you and that you have a vision for, you have to give yourself permission to be greater and more effective than what other people know you're capable of doing, than what other people expect of you. So when I look at The Last Dance, for instance, I look at Rodman not playing basketball until he was 21. I look at Scottie Pippen, and when they talked to his childhood friend, he said, Scottie always believed that he was gonna play in the NBA. The reporter says, did you believe him? And he says, no, and he laughs, right? Um, I look at the fact that Michael Jordan wasn't picked first. He wasn't picked second. He was picked third, right? 
I, I look at the fact that Rodman was picked like in the second round, late in the second round. All of these guys, one thing that they all have in common is that the level of greatness that they achieved was far greater than what the majority of people in their lives expected of them. And so if they had stopped at the beginning of their journeys and said, hey, guys, do I need to be trying this thing of being, you know, one of the greatest rebounders, defenders or scorers or champions in NBA history? Most people would say, nah, man, that's not necessary. You don't need to be doing all of that. Right. But they got their conviction from what they saw in their own potential and from what they wanted to do. And so for us, we're, we're in the process of building a brand that aims to inspire people of every age all over the world to rise to the occasion of their potential. And when you just consider how many people are doing that, it seems to be the case that, you know, this market is oversaturated. Why give it a try? And for me, I don't care about any of that. You know, um, my favorite quote is by Howard Thurman, ask not yourself what the world needs, but rather, rather what makes you come alive? For that is what the world needs, people who have come alive. I don't do what I do because someone else tells me they think it's important. I do what I do because it's the kind of thing that consumes me. It's the kind of thing that I can't stop thinking about. And it's that kind of energy, which when you bring to your work, makes it work. You're never going to be successful at something because you're going around taking a bunch of surveys. Mom, high school teacher, what do you think I'll be great at? No, that's just going to make you mediocre and average. You want to be better than half the planet at what you do? You want to be remembered by history for what you do? Ask yourself, what's the thing that I'm so obsessed with that I'll do it even if somebody presents a scientific argument promising me that I'll fail? Screw that argument. I don't care if there's evidence that I'm going to fail. I have to do this, right? And that's what Revolution of One is for me. And that's the kind of mindset that those Bulls guys had. I'm winning a championship. And it's not just about like, it's not about like, oh, me being famous. It's about me fulfilling my destiny of helping people overcome the excuses that they use to hold themselves back from living their best life. Does that answer your question, brother? Mic drop. <laughs> All right, man. I guess we go wrap it right there, there. That's all that needed to be said.